hello and welcome. Another episode, episode 13. So, you're more than welcome. My name's Penny. I live in the southeast of England with my husband Pete, who's going to do a little bit on the vlog, and my five chickens, one of whom hasn't been so well this week. Uh, yeah, she's, oh, her tummy's been a bit upset, but I've been up there today, just now actually, and she started eating again, so I'm hopeful that tomorrow she'll be feeling more like her own self. It's Daisy Doo who hasn't been so well. So anyway, but I did collect their eggs, and look at this one. I mean, this is the egg I collected. Oh, can I show you? Can you see how big it is? I'm in a different room today. Look how big that is in the egg cup. It's massive. It's more like a duck's egg. So I'll enjoy that. That will be like eating two eggs. So Pete's watching, what's he in the other room? I'm doing it later in the day. And he's watching Only Fools and Horses, the best bits. I have closed the doors because people have phoned um, and said, let me know when Pete's laughing about a program because I like listening because he's got such a laugh. But anyway, I hope you can't hear so that we can have a chat. So welcome. So let's start with the fascinating fact. And I'm going to put up a little film of the J family that are in our garden and I've taken them and yeah, they've raised their young successfully. And so I thought you might like to see them. When we look at birds, many species of birds, their feathers remain permanently bright and visit, vivid. Have you ever wondered why? I mean, let's face it, our clothes don't, do they? And paint doesn't. It, everything fades, doesn't it? Everything fades, which is why we're constantly renewing things. But birds, they most of them look perky most of the time. So what's the secret? Well, Dr. Andrew Parnell, I discovered, I think it was the University of Sheffield, but don't hold me to that because I haven't made a note of it, but I think it was. He started looking at the jay's feathers and he's discovered their colours are generated primarily in small changes in feather construction. So it's not about the pigment. You would think, wouldn't you, that it's about the pigment, but it's not. It's about the feather construction. And what happens is surface variations on this construction, scattered and reflected light, which produces the hues we see. And since the structure doesn't change with age, the colours never fade. And so this discovery, he says, opens a whole new world because if they apply it to paint or material fabric then well the sky's the limit isn't it with uh, our clothes not fading and us being able to hold things for much longer and not having to renew them so the key points there are birds generate their color using structure not dyes and pigment and the jay is able to change the color of its feathers along the equivalent of a single human hair. And this discovery may lead to synthetic structural color that could be made cheaply and used in paints and clothes that won't fade like dyes and pigments. There, there's my fascinating fact for this week. So I hope you enjoyed that. I did. I mean, you would have always thought, wouldn't you, it's pigment, but no, nope, it's structure. So there we are. We can put that somewhere in our head and see if we remember it but even if we don't it's there isn't it we've learnt it today and so I want to show a bit of crafting but the light's going now so I'm just going to see how it goes right I said I'd show you what was in my bag do you remember this bag and what it is is it's a jumper for Pete and it's made with this wool let Lope, it is absolutely pure de brilliant. It's fantastic. Heather, who writes the poems, <laughs> she's Scottish and she, she, she says, come on, she teaches me these little Scottish phrases and now pure de brilliant, so it is. 
is part of my vocabulary. Anyway, let's press on. Let low P. It is super. I can't, I can't tell you about it. If you go out for a walk in a jumper made of this and it starts, you know, just raining a bit or it, it won't go through. It's not waterproof, but you know, it's pucker wool, Icelandic wool. And I looked at a little, little video of how they do the sheep. They get them up and them, take them across the rivers, put them on the mountains, bring them back, shear them and do all this. It's amazing what they have to do. It is a lovely video. It's truly gorgeous. And if I can, I don't know if I can, I'll put the link below. This is what people do, isn't it? If I can, I will. If not, just trust me, it's Icelandic wool. I got it from Wool Warehouse. I think it's something like 280 a ball. I mean, you can't believe the price. 280 a ball, it's, it's fantastic. And so I'm knitting him the Ridari sweater. I'll put it up here. And it's an Icelandic, you know, it's got a yoke and it doesn't have seams down the side. Oh, I might have it here. I don't know if you'll see. There. Yeah, it's the Ridari. So you knit, you knit up to here and then leave it, knit the sleeve and then you join all of that together, sleeve, all of that, sleeve, and then you knit the yoke. It's quite good, and I can honestly say I'm thoroughly enjoying knitting it. Thoroughly enjoying it. I can't start the sleeve, which is what I'm dying to do, because I haven't got the right needles. You knit it on four needles, like you do a sock, and so it's all in the round. There's no seam up the sleeve. And I haven't, I've got, I've got sock size, not 3.5. Uh, and then you change to a 4.5. Well, I've got those, but I haven't got the 3.5. So I've sent off to Wool Warehouse to get some more. I've got a so blue, a light blue, and a grey, and a black. Well, it's not black. When you see the colours, it's got so many different colours in it. You can't quite explain it. Can you see? Look, hues of green. Green, Nanny. I don't know if she's still saying that, but I've got a little film sent to me. And she's, how does a cow go? Moo. How does a sheep go? Bah. She knows all that now. So that's quite fun. Anyway, so they're the colours that I'm doing it in. I love this one. I'm going to be doing myself one because I just love knitting with it. It's it's almost like homespun. I'll show you the back and the front. Oh, got a pile of stuff here. So here's here's the bottom of it. It's got a cute little bottom bit. It sort of rolls up. Can you see? No, it's not ribbed. It just rolls up. And then you've got that nice pattern along the bottom. And then, of course, no seams because you knit it in the round. And that's where I am. I'm up to the armhole now. So I want, I'm just waiting to start the sleeve might do a couple more rows just to, um, it's hard to see when you it's your first one it's hard to see how tight under the arm it is or does it come a bit lower uh, I I've got a feeling it's going to come quite high so I think I might just do a couple more rows till the um till the needles come so that's the Ridari but I'll show you when it's all done I hope the light's good enough here I might have to turn you around a bit in a minute so we can get the light from the window. But you can see it's it's got so many different colours in it. It's really lovely. So I'll show you that as we go along. So that was the Ridari. I think I'm going to have to call it a day and come back tomorrow okay, because and the light's just not good enough. And I don't want to keep swirling around and feeling a bit agitated. So I'll see you in the morning. Bye.
Well, it'll just be like that for you, but for me it'll be the morning. Bye. Now, I won't say bye because it's the middle, isn't it? I don't say bye in the middle. Right, see you in a minute. Well, good morning, I'm back. And uh, the only place that there's enough light to, to do this is in the conservatory. So I think that's where I'm going to be from now on because it's a rainy old week and, um, yeah, so... It's always bright out here, so I hope that's all right. Got a bit of reflection, but hey-ho, you know, it's not the BBC, is it? So what I wanted to show you was Lois's quilt. Yeah, I'm going to be making a quilt for Tommy. And this was Lois's actual quilt. But, oh, it's such fun. I love the fabric. And you could never get it again. It was just a one-off. Can you see that? It's really quirky. And I loved it. Let me stand up. So that was Lois's quilt. Uh, I have made it, yeah, I've made it uh, for people, yeah, clients. I love it as a baby quilt. It's just the right, just the right size. And I'll show you the pattern. Let's put that on there. It's from this book, Kids Undercover. That's a good, good one, isn't it? Lynette Jensen. It was quite popular in the day and it's called Kids Will Be Kids and it's 30 by 38 inches. We do everything in inches in the quilt world. We haven't gone to centimetres. So there it is. So I'll show you what fabric I bought for her. Right, the back bit is going to be this. It's Tilda and it's Small Farm. Tiny Farm. That's it. And it's Tilda. So I'm going to use that for the back, for the backing. Is that the right way up? Yes. Little hens and horses, pigs. Oh, that reminds me. Pete's piece, we talk about pigs in it, it just comes up. And we've had a long conversation about pigs. Yeah, I googled it and um, anyway, I haven't got time to tell you now. Maybe next time I will. Maybe next time I'll just enlarge on the pig bit. But it's true. In 1952, people had pigs. There was half a million. People had pigs in their back garden. Uh, well, I'm telling you now. People had... <laughs> People had pigs in their back garden, half a million people did, um, and they had to give half to the government because of rationing. But in 1953, that was all lifted and they could keep the whole pig for themselves. And it went up to a million people keeping pigs in their back garden. And what with the pig swill that he's talking about, he talks about doing the pig swill little job. What happened was even in Tottenham, Edmonton, on the corners or wherever, they had buckets and they had this and that. And just like we have the green bin now, whatever you do, the compost bin, people used to just go down to that station, empty it all in, and then the um, council would, you know, whatever, heat it right up and it'd be delivered to the farmers in blocks and they would add water with it. And then Pete's job was to to take the bucket, yeah. Anyway, I talk about that, but it, he's quite right. I went, what? And he said, yeah, so there we are. Anyway, that's the backing. And then this is one of the fabrics. It's the Tilda Farm. Oh, yes. It's always good to look at the 
the edge, the selvage, because then you can match up. Say you're not having it from that collection of fabrics. That gives you the colours to match up. It's a good idea to look at that. So that's one. And this one's like a sand colour. See if I can get the colour right for you there. And then this one, I've got a plain sand. I don't know where I'm going to put that in, but I just thought, because then you can quilt on that and it'll show up nicely. I might quilt his name or for the label or whatever, I don't know. And then this little bit of blue is needed for something. That's a very pretty blue. It's coming out a little bit darker on screen. But when I upload it, it might be better. And then this one. Oh, I love this one. Yeah, it's got all the little farm implements. The saw and the plant pots and the beehive and the greenhouse and the wheelbarrow and the packet of seeds. Yeah, everything you'd need. That's gorgeous, isn't it? And then the last one, Tiny Farm Collection. This is Farm Animals Blue. Nice, isn't it? So as that goes along, as I make it, I'll keep you up to date with it. Okay, I'm popping off now. I'm going to make a cup of tea and then I'll come back and do some transactional analysis. I'm getting some messages that people like it. So thank you very much. Um, I'm up to speed now with all this, DMs and all of that, direct messages. But anyway, I'm getting messages that people like it. So I'm going to do my next little bit of transactional analysis. But I'll go and make a cup of tea and I'll see you in a minute. Well, I've had my cup of tea. And uh, yeah, let's have a little chat about TA. I hope you're finding it helpful. Very early days and quite a lot to learn. Oh, and a word I learned this week was neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity means the ability to form and reorganize synaptic connections, especially in response to learning. So TA is all about change. We've all got the ability to change. You know, don't say, oh no, well that's me, you know, I can't change, that's the way I think. Not at all. Neuroplasticity means we can change the synapses in our brain and we can change the way we think and therefore the way we make decisions and what we decide upon. And that's really what counselling's all about. It's the first thing I used to say to clients, counselling is about change. And to make change, we have to understand. And so that I find TA is a very good way of helping us to understand. So there's some things that we say in TA that, um, yeah, everyone has the capacity to think and change. So I can think, you can think, and that if we think, if, if we have the capacity to think, Obviously, some people can't if they've had brain injury or they have severe mental health problems. But most of us have the capacity to think and therefore to change. And also in TA, which is the most one of the most important things about TA is we say people are OK. I'm OK. You're OK. And we're OK in the fundamentals of being human. What we do might not be OK. But as humans, we are okay. So I say, I'm okay, you're okay. Now, that's the way we want to be in life. I'm okay, you're okay. And when you think about it, we were talking about a negative nurturing parent. And what she was saying to people is, you're not okay because you can't do it for yourself. You need me to help you. You can't sort things out. You're not okay. And do you remember last week, I talked about our power being diminished because of that. So we want to say, you're okay, I'm okay. And that's what she says, you're okay. 
you can you can look up the train times if you need a hand just ask but we're saying you're okay I'm okay we don't want to take that away from anyone another important thing is we can't be made to feel by others people say oh they make me feel no because we can choose the way we feel about certain things that are happening or going on we can decide and then the decisions we've made in the past we can change this neuroplasticity we might learn new ways of being and so we can change the decisions we made yeah so that's very very important now when we're infants or small people we make decisions about ourselves the world the people around us and those decisions that we made then might be causing us to feel uncomfortable I mean let's face it she made those decisions because grown-ups in her life were telling her you must you should you ought you know yes you must always be kind you must always be helpful and so that's what she is but she can change she can change those decisions and she can change to decide how do I feel? What do I think? Hmm. Do you need a hand? Just ask. So we might gain insight and we might then be able to change the decisions we made as a child. And these are real and lasting changes. And some people like to make a journal or a map about the changes that are happening to them whilst they go uh, through counselling or whilst, whilst they, uh, you know, are learning these new techniques. And so if it suits you, it never suited me, as I've told you. I could never keep it up. I prefer it just to be a, yeah, a change that I can feel. But some people like to do journaling. And so it, it might be that you could look, you could make some journal things. How do I feel? What do I think? What do I feel? Yeah, feel, think, behaviour. Behaving, thinking, feeling. What was my behaviour? What was I doing at that time? What was I thinking? And what was I feeling? They are the three words that we are going to use all the way through TA. What was she thinking? She's thinking, yeah, I ought to help that person because, you know, they'll struggle otherwise and it'll be hard for them. What was she feeling? Oh, she's feeling this feeling of, if I don't, it wouldn't be right. Yeah, they need help. It's up to me to do it. And so how was she behaving? Okay, she was being quite direct in the way she was talking to that person. So yeah, to note those three things down, behaving, thinking and feeling uh, in your journal might be helpful. Now we talked about an ego state, this is the negative nurturing parent ego state and this is the positive nurturing parent ego state. Now this ego state is a name to describe a way of being, it's not a thing inside of me. So I'm not going to say oh the child inside of me wants to do this or that, no it's a name we give to the behaving, thinking and feeling that we're experiencing at the moment. So, the negative nurturing parent involves a discount. No, you can't do it. You're not okay. It's a discount. I mean, it's such a shame for her because she's running herself ragged, isn't she? Thinking that she's doing right. But actually, what she's doing is She's discounting. She's saying you're not okay. Whereas this positive regard, you're okay. And that's what we want. There's a lot to take in. You might like to replay that and just let that and understand it because they are the fundamentals of TA. Okay. So I'm going to introduce to you two more parents and then we will have done the parent ego states. So here we go with another negative parent. This one 
there's this discount again. You're not okay. I'm okay. <laughs> there he is, off to work. He's okay. You're not okay. He, he often uses those words, should, ought, must. You know what you should do. You know what you ought to do. Yeah, you know what you must do. He puts this not okay on the other person. Oh, yeah. The negative controlling parent. None of us like to be controlled by someone who says should or must. But do we employ that ourselves? Do we find ourselves saying, you know what you should do, even with a smile on our face? You know what you ought to do? Yeah. You know what? Or we say it to ourselves, I must. Yeah, I must. We can turn it in on ourselves. I should, I ought. Negative controlling parent. We're going to be talking about these a lot more. So don't worry, just absorb it. Just, just get the picture. I thought he summed up the negative controlling parent. Of course, we've got the positive controlling parent. Maybe a school teacher, a grown up in our life when we were young, because don't forget it's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors copied from, from grown ups, teachers, or adults in our lives and this teacher was a super one never put us down I'm okay you're okay but what he did say was look left and right before you cross the road don't burp when you're in company all the things that have taught us and we've copied that have stood us in good stead for our adult life I'm okay you're okay he certainly never gave it with a discount or with a not okay message. So this is what we want. The, all the things that we copied when we were kids, when we were children, and we've brought them up with us today. Thoughts, feelings and behaviours copied from our grown-up figures in our lives. This one was always, you're okay, I'm okay. Don't talk to strangers. Yeah. Get home before it gets dark. All those things. Be kind to others. Yeah. But always with an I'm okay, you're okay. This one not. I'm okay. You're not okay. Behaving thinking and feeling. So we'll look into that a little bit more next week. Um, I'm going to show you the child ego state. Now something that uh, may help you when you're in this maybe or when you're well just something don't let's apply it to to that but something that might help you I found is my emotional purse and I was talking to someone this week about my emotional purse. Someone might say, oh, can you do that for me? Or, you know, you, you just see a need. Yeah, you just see a need. And you're the nurturing parent and you want to help. And that would be okay if you did it from an I'm okay, you're okay. You need some help. I don't mind. You, I've said to you, if you need help, just ask. But at the same time, we need to say, how much money have I got in my emotional purse? And when I look in my imaginary emotional purse, today, well, I've got six pounds in there. So I must have been doing some things to put that money in. Actually, I did. Had a couple of nice days just replenishing my emotional purse. And that's good to see up there. Yeah, six pounds. Now, I might have looked up there and seen how much money was in my emotional purse, might only been 10 pence. 
Now, what this person, I've said, if you need a help, if you need a hand, just ask. They might come and ask me, oh, can you give me a hand? Well, I've said I would. You're okay, I'm okay. But what they're asking me to do is actually going to cost me ooh, a pound. I've only got 10 pence in my emotional purse. So what I need to ask myself before I say yes is, can I put some more money in my emotional purse soon? In other words, can I have a rest? Can I take some time out? Whatever it is. I mean, crafting puts money in my emotional purse. Crafting's very good for my mental health. Whatever, it might be a run for you. It might be all different things. But whatever it is, can you, in the immediate future, put that money in your emotional purse? If you can't, you're going to be running on deficit. You're going to be running on overdraft. And that's just not healthy for us. And what some people do is they, they do that all the time. And when they check in their emotional past, wow, are they in deficit. So they've got to stop giving for the time being, put some money in, maybe have a holiday or do some crafting or take some time out, put some money into their emotional purse. Yeah, have a good rest or go for a run or whatever it is that puts that money in your emotional purse and then you're in a position to help someone. Until that time comes, then you're going to be running on deficit and even though you're in I'm okay, you're okay mood, that's not going to be good for us. So that's just something that you might learn. Look back, other times when you've really given of yourself but that's cost you and you haven't put that money back in. So I'm always checking my emotional purse and I'm very pleased to say I've got quite a bit of money in there. That's through taking some time out last week. So I better leave it here because we're going to go right into overdraft time-wise. So I'll see you later. Well, it's Pete's piece now. So uh, before I move and say see you later, Pete's coming up next. So this week, Pete's piece, I think he's going to still stick with your childhood, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. And tell us cool. about what it was like working at one of those farms that you talked about last week, Bridgefoot Farm. Bridgefoot Farm. Yeah. Uh, well, we didn't just work in the fields. We had little jobs to do when we got to the farm. We used to turn up. And one of the jobs they gave me, now I was quite small when I was, well, it was, what was it, 56? I was eight, at any rate. Yeah. And I wasn't that big. And uh, they gave me the job of feeding the pigs. Oh. And that it would be swill, which is something else that's different now. Pig swill, you know. Yeah. Well, is it, well that was all the food that was left over at the schools. Everywhere, and, things, and it wasn't all it? used to get all used to get boiled up. And uh, oh, oh, they boiled it. Oh, well, they didn't just dunk; otherwise, it'd be rancid. Wouldn't yeah. It? No, they boiled it all up and made. Oh. And it was like a sludge when it. Oof. And they and the farmers probably you did the did it themselves. I mean, people kept pigs in their back gardens. Not in your day. Well, the, did the you 50s, know anybody had a pig in their back garden? Well, I mean, it did it did happen? Not necessarily in London. I oh, know. But out in the farm places, it did, and oh. uh, they used to feed all the swill to them. But anyway, my job was to feed them, and and to that they. They had electric fence, believe it or not. I was, yeah. And looking back, I think, I mean, they were pretty forward to have an electric fence. Yeah. But it was only it was only that much because they weren't very big pigs. Right. And uh, it was, I suppose it's about that high from the ground, just mm -hmm. enough to stop. Stop them. Well, the swill came in big galvanised buckets. Right. Which I had to carry across, which yeah. was hard enough. Of course. But then I, every time I tried to lift this bucket over, oh. what's happened there? What's that badink? Uh, what was that? It's probably an email or oh. something. <laughs> anyway, I'm trying to lift this bucket, and I used to touch the electric fence, and that's. <laughs> and I used to, I it won't go near the electric fence around the. Well, I couldn't drop the bucket oh. because that means swill everywhere. It yeah. had to go in a trough, yeah. and all the pigs are all coming. They don't get too close to the fence, but they're all knowing what's coming. Yeah, no, not big, not huge, big things like 
Harriet, you know, the other day on Harriet. And they, oh, and, um, so cute little piggies. Yeah. But you had to get the and smell And that was over. one of my jobs. And oh. I always remember the smell of the farm. It wasn't a horrible smell. You know, sometimes you, oh, it was just a fun. It's a mixed farm, so it had the smell of everything. Yeah. In the in the wasn't summer, just the smell of mud. Dusty, and the chickens were everywhere, all running about. Oh, it sounds and, lovely. And of course, the river went by. That's why it was called Bridge Foot Farm, because there was a bridge over the river. Oh, I can't think of the name of the a river. A real Hertfordshire farm. Yeah, yeah, no, it wasn't Hertfordshire. There, it was Middlesex. Was it? Yeah, when we moved to Potter's Park, it was in Middlesex. Well, I never. And it wasn't till a couple of years after they changed it to uh, Hertfordshire. Hertfordshire. And that was a story on its own because we had a vote. The people had a vote. Do you want to stay in Middlesex or do you want to go into Hertfordshire? And they and all the posh people wanted to go into Hertfordshire. I was going to say I'd want to go into Hertfordshire. Well, yeah. No, that so that it was carried. Yeah. And then they were all moaning because the rates doubled. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Hertfordshire had much higher rates oh, than Middlesex. Oh, yes. And, uh, That's the yeah, snob value of <laughs> yeah. Hertfordshire on Middlesex. Oh, my mum was just moaning, you know. Oh, mum, no, <laughs> yes, of course she was. Yeah, that was a good yeah. time ago. And, but, yeah, go on. But the, yeah, the, 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 um, the street river, little river, used to run nearby and we used to go down there. They didn't have horses, though. All right. That's one thing they didn't have, horses. They had pigs, they had few sheep, had cattle, uh, and a lot of it was corn, you know, growing wheat and stuff. That's when we did the scoots with stooking. But we, we used, one of the things we did was to follow the river. In fact, it wasn't the river, it was called the Mims Hall Brook. Mims Hall Brook, right. But it was... It was um, and when you say follow it... What? Well, do we want it to, to trace it, go upstream? To, well, oh. I don't know, downstream, I think it would be. Well, then whatever. We were, we were following it. Righty-ho. And, um, yes, it was upstream. But downstream, it was downstream, <laughs> because where we, where we did follow it, it, it went all along by the side, which is now the, um, the A1M. It's right next to it now. Right. And... Um, we got to, I can't name the village, but it's a little tiny place. It had two pubs. One of them was called uh, the Maypole and the other one was the Woodman. The Maypole. We went to the Maypole, Yeah, we did, we? Yeah. yeah. It's an old, really old yeah. Tudor building. And, and you it, showed me, you took me there to show me this part of the river or something. Yeah, well, behind the Woodman, if you went in, into the car park of the Woodman... Yeah. And then we cut across the fields. You get get to the stream again to get to the river again, and it would suddenly disappear. The it river would, would just going into all these. Uh, well, in the summer it was dry. You could walk, but then, then there was all this like. Well, they were called sinkholes. I thought they were called swallow. Swallow holes. holes. Swallow that's holes. It. Yeah, well swallow. done. Oh, that's a story that they we need to tell swallow. you when he went down a sinkhole. <laughs> no, they were called swallow yeah, holes. Swallow holes. I it? remember you taking me there yeah. now. And I was scared stiff of the place. Were you? Oh, uh, I were hated you it. Were scared of sw being swallowed? Yeah, out? Oh. I was frightened. It was gonna because you, there was only it's only little tiny, probably a six inch hole. But it was all mud, and, and in, the, in the summer it would all be, you know, our mud cracks. Yeah. But you didn't know how safe it was. Yeah. And we used to gingerly to work our way, and there was quite a few of them. But in the winter, yeah. it was it was like a big lake. Oh. It didn't go whirly around like a whirlpool. It was like a big lake. Wow. And gradually it would dry sit, up. Dry, but in these swallow holes. Oh. And that's when you couldn't really walk. Because you didn't know where you were, no. you know, even had wellies or something. When yeah. You to but yeah, we used to go, we used to start, you know, go along there. Well, we used to walk it. It's quite a long walk from the farm. But, um, so what a lovely thing to, you know, say goodbye to your mum, set out, go and yeah. help do your little jobs, doing the pigs yeah. and doing the stooking, and then oh, let's go to the river. Mm. And all the time, take it, you were taking in. Everything that was around you, the birds and the, the sounds and, and the butterflies. And also yeah. the dragonflies and stuff, you know. But there was a horrible thing that happened then, what well, that? that you were taking in. Because I remember you telling me that you'd look over there and there'd be a rabbit. Oh, that was, yeah. Well, that was, what, what time was that? That was 
Well, there was an outbreak in 1953. So you're you're now 58. Not, yeah, 19, 19, no, I'm, not, I'm, I'm eight years old. That's... I'm 53 and eight years old. Are you? Well, I'm born in 45. Yeah. Five and three. 45, 50, 53. Oh, so but there wasn't. That was an outbreak. That's when it first came to England, but it didn't necessarily come to Potts Bar then. Yeah, but it was the um, myxomatosis. That's right. Oh crumbs! Yeah, that was awful. But you remember it? Yeah, because by the time we were, it didn't take long to spread across the no, whole country. No, and um, and it was introduced, wasn't it? It was. Well, it came. It wasn't introduced to this car. I think it came from Spain. Oh. Somehow, but it was introduced in Australia because they had so much problem with rabbits. Oh right, Ma it was a man introduced thing, yeah. but then it all spread. Well, when it got to us, like wild what I'm I found in at the time, yeah, it was it. It was while I was working on the farm that we it came. Yeah, because you know I remember me saying we did the stooking and that. Well, what the. the when they cut the corn, they always used to cut around the edges and work in, and so you're left with a little tiny square. Well, all the wildlife runs into that little square until it can't, then it runs out, and right. you get rabbits. And of course, the, some of the farm, you know, would have shot guns and they'd shoot the rabbits because they used to eat them. Yeah. And, um, and other things would come out mice and all sorts of yeah. stuff and just but run it's... away because it. Yeah. Uh, but what was horrible was these. Poor rabbits would just crawl out. I won't go into detail, no. but it was it wasn't pleasant. And I've seen like the big bloke who kicked me by accident that time. Oh yeah, he was in tears when he saw these 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 animals. Oh. He was in tears. Big husky bloke. Yeah. You know? And well, and it had repercussions. Yeah. That. You know the the people who were uh, the farm. A lot of the farmers are the big. Big estate owners were where they were a problem. Yeah. They thought it was great because all these rabbits were dying. Yeah. But then there was rabbit was a very cheap food so source in the UK, and it was still rationing meat was rationed. Yeah. Rabbit wasn't rationed because there were so many of them. Yeah. So there was a food source for for poor for poor people. Yeah. Which there was a lot of after the war. Of course. The furriers got People hit. People like rabbit anyway. Yeah. The furriers got hit because they used to lose the rabbit skin to make... Yeah, my granddad was yeah. a furrier. Yeah. And, uh, so they had, and also the people who like shooting in a way, and they used to shoot for the... And obviously sell the rabbits, but yeah. it was a sport. Yeah. They didn't like it. No. And also... Just people didn't like it because they didn't like to see the animals suffer like they did. Exactly, and also you couldn't eat it. Nobody wanted Oh no! And I think there's a bit in um, you're you're reading the Darling Buds of May, aren't you? Yeah. Well, there's a bit in there where he goes, Mixie. Well, yeah. what, rabbit I wouldn't eat rabbit. Mixie. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. And um, that must have carried on for me because I remember when we were first married, you said you wanted a rabbit. And I didn't want. I want a rabbit. You wanted me to cook rabbit. Oh yeah, do you remember? Oh, yeah. well. And I cooked this whole rabbit. <laughs> I didn't know how to cook. I, a bit and he like said, rice oh, pudding, isn't I it? said, I've cooked you a rice. I've now <laughs> cooked you a rabbit, and I draped this rabbit round the plate like that. <laughs> Yeah, no thanks. And I didn't didn't dice it or anything. <laughs> no. I didn't need <laughs> it. No, it must have carried on from there. No, thank you. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, but do that... we still have Mixie now? Yeah, it comes and goes now. Right. It's um, well, it, you know, and it, it it is keeping the rabbit population down. That's and for sure. of course, birds of prey. Yeah, well, they all suffer. You see, and then what happened after the birds of prey couldn't eat the rabbits? What did they go for? Chickens, people's chickens, um, or you know, yeah, um, yeah, other things, pheasants, yeah. You know, I mean, they they would have been eating them anyway, but not in the numbers when the rabbits at all. That was the prime source. Yeah, foxes. Yeah, foxes. You you know, and they well, maybe at... they ate them and then they were poorly well, too. They anyway, might it's done. a horrible story. The carrion crows and that were eating them. And what it was a story that Winston Churchill got involved with. But he was anti myxomatosis. He made it a criminal offence to, to actually because people were getting the what, what do they call it. Virus, virusy bit, you know, and putting it in, in places where there's lots of rabbits. Yeah, but he made it un, a criminal, a criminal offence. So I think Mixy was very much part of our childhood. Even mm. I wasn't a country girl, but 
I knew what myxomatosis was. Well, because of the food you, you know, the, yeah. you no more rabbit in the shop. We never ate rabbit at home. Oh. Well, oh, maybe that's rabbit. why, because you see, yeah. I was so much younger. Yeah, you were four years old. I'll have to ask anyway. Mum on Mum's yeah. piece, did, did you ever eat rabbit before Mixie? Mm. Yeah, so here you are, following this river and going to the swallow holes and doing your little jobs around the farm, and this horrible thing happened. Hmm. Yeah. It was horrible. It was horrible, wasn't it? But so lovely that you were a little lad and you could be out and about all day long. Yeah. And of course, the other thing that's different now yeah. is that South Mims, which was a little village, and we used to go out there on our bikes cycling out there. And there was a, there was another river up there that used to go across the, across the road at this little lane. All right. And we used to always go to that lane and we'd stand by the road waiting for a car to come across, which, in, you know, you can imagine, it weren't many. Yeah. But we'd, we'd wait for, you for know. A big splash. And then we'd, as, it, as it came down the hill, we'd, we'd be going faster, faster. And then some of them would go faster and all the water would come up and others would go gingerly through it and we'd all go, moo. Oh, <laughs> if no. they, if they, <laughs> We all cheered if they went fast. And that sort of thing, you know, used to keep us amused. Lovely. But uh, that was, you know, we used to cycle out all over the place, North Thor and, uh, well, and now it's, um, I, I don't know where the food would be now because it's... Also built the, up. Well, it's the services for the, end, for yeah, the for motorway, the, isn't it? Yes, the, uh, it's all gone. For the M25, it's all round through that. Yeah. Well, thanks for that, Pete. I'm going yes. to introduce the little film that I'm putting up now. Now, as birders, birders have lists. We have lists that we see this year or this month or today or lists that, lifetime lists. Uh, I couldn't get to grips with the lists when I first started doing it. A book for this and a book for that and a list for here and a list for there. And uh, what I wanted to do this week was put up a little film of all the birds that we've, we've seen in the garden. It's impossible because, uh, one, I haven't got film of all of it, but two, we'd be here, we'd be here, well, this would never end and, and you need an ending. So I'm just going to tell you the bits that are missing. <laughs> Male and female mallard, duck, you know, the ones you see over the park. A honey buzzard flew over, rare. Beautiful, beautiful. More hen we've had in the garden paddling around. A woodcock, only once because it was such a dreadful winter. And uh, yeah, they're usually in the countryside. We looked out, wow, a woodcock. That was super. Uh, a turtle dove, one of Pete's favourite birds. I mean, people that don't know birds, they could just look at it and say pigeon. But a turtle dove is right on the decline. And they're beautiful. A field fair, that was a lovely one. A red wing, a black cap. I mean, you see so many black caps, but we've had them in the garden, but I haven't got a little film of them. The tack, tack, tack of a black cap. That's how you hear them. Tack, tack, tack. Oh, there's a, there's a black cap. Anyway, haven't got a film of that. Chiff, chaff. It's got black legs. It does look very like a willow warbler. We've had willow warblers in here too. A gold crest. Tiny little bird. One of the smallest birds there is with a bright, bright head. Gold crest. A coal tit. Well, I haven't got a picture of that in the garden, but we have them on the feeders. But we jump up and down when they're here. A jackdaw. A brambling. A greenfinch, a siskin. Oh, we had a right load of siskins earlier in the year. Linnet and bullfinch. I think that's our list for our garden, as well as the ones that I'm going to put up now. So I hope you enjoy it. I mean, if you're not into birds, well, perhaps you can just enjoy the nature and uh, the peace and calm of the music, and maybe you'll learn. A, a, a little bit about birds but if not I'll say cheerio so I'll see you next week bye thanks for watching
Thank you.